Hi everyone, uh, welcome to another, uh, maybe I, I hope is the last sort of edition of SAS engineering in 2023. Uh, today we have a, a very interesting topic. Uh, we have Asha from World Loop. She calls herself the chief LLM sorcerer. Uh, and she's here to mesmerize us all with, with, with her experience taking LLMs to production. So, Asha, thank you very much for, for giving this talk and please take it away. Thanks, Shiva, and thanks for uh, having me here. So, yeah, let's get started, right? Yeah, as uh, Shiva said, this is what I am these days, Chief LLM Sorcerer. Uh, well, I kind of lead the ML team at Warloop. It's been three years at Warloop now. Uh, previously, I was with early stage product startups in the field of NLP computer vision. I was building SaaS products into in the B2B and B2C space. And lately, my work has been more around integrating LLMs to our products and trying to tap the potential of generative AI. Right. So let's quickly talk a little bit about the context, uh, which is Verloop. Verloop is a conversational AI SaaS product which enables complete end-to-end -end customer support automation for businesses. We work across varied verticals like banking and finance, insurance, uh, ed tech, etc. We have about 2 million plus messages on our platform per day, and um, we enable conversational bots Plus, um, we enable agents to work better, and we have uh, you know a whole lot of dashboarding and insights built in into our product. We also integrate to various third-party softwares to do this efficiently across multiple channels and platforms. Right. So, with that context set, let me dive into uh, you know when it all started. Right. So, the aha moment came last year, November 2022, December 2022, we saw the launch of ChatGPT. And so generative models are not new, right? Uh, but what, what happened that time was the potential became more evident. Uh, what OpenAI did was it democratized the whole generative AI space and made it more ac accessible. And uh, since then, there have been like a flurry of things that have been happening. There have been a lot of advancements with new open source models that have come in. Uh, people are fine tuning for specific uh, use cases and releasing these models on Hugging Face. And there are just a whole lot of leaderboards which keep getting updated everywhere, right? So every time we see, I see Twitter, there is some new thing or the other. And archive is all about new papers which are coming out you know, at, at such a rapid speed. So well, where did that take us? So I'm just kind of rewinding back to this and where we started from. Yeah, and we had the hammer and we were looking for the nails. And the more we saw, there was just um, you know use cases everywhere. So there were just a plethora of use cases we could use our LLM models for. And in our case, it was the most obvious was to orchestrate bot conversations. But there were plenty of other use cases as well. Uh, so some are agent assistants and productivity enablers, like you have grammar assistance, rephrasing, uh, summarization, and then you have post facto analysis, which is quality control of these chats, right? And you know, and so on and so forth. We also had use cases where we could use to steer the conversations better. We could do slot filling with the uh, slot filling is basically recognizing intents and entities, etc for storing and routing chats, et cetera, based on them, right? So use cases were there everywhere. Now, the next question for us was, you know, which ones to pick first? So before that, there was a reality check um, wherein you had these closed source APIs, which came with their own set of uh, issues. Some of them were latency issues. Then you had reliability issues, right? Even uh, every now and then you get mails from OpenAI saying, you know, their server is down or some uh, bottlenecks are there on their APIs. So you had rate limiting issues and people were talking uh, a lot about the kind of hallucinations they were facing. Um, there were steerability issues where the, you know, the LLM was not really doing what you asked it to do. 
and there was also some amount of um, you know reasoning and math skills which were being questioned of course things have changed uh, to some extent since that time there are uh, new models and developments that are happening around this but broadly yeah there were just a lot of restrictions there were also token restrictions you were limited to how many tokens you could send because each to each model that you had was limited by the total number of tokens you could send in the input uh, if you look at open source models and this i'm talking early feb uh, this year where the llama model actually came out we had the open source models and then they came with their own set of uh, deployment challenges hosting and then the whole costing bit right so all of that was the reality check for us and right so the question for us was which one should we tackle first and the way we decided to narrow it down was we wanted to kind of play it safe there we looked at those use cases where there was some amount of human in the loop where we could have a human validate it where these use cases did not have you know extremely tight latencies they were not mission critical uh, it was still a manageable rps that we are talking about so the things that struck us at that time was uh, productivity enhancement kind of use cases, which are typically uh, agent assistance kind of uh, cases, right? Where you had these agents being able to validate the uh, LLM's responses before actually it hits the final end user. So this is what we picked. And this is basically uh, where the agent is actually responding to the customer. And while responding, you have all these features available to the agent where the agent can pick uh, any of these. So the agent can choose to rephrase. And uh, many times they want to rephrase it in better English. They might want to expand it. So you could write a very short thing, but it could be expanded to whichever format you want. You could change the tone to make it more polite. So these were very safe features for us to build first. And so uh, that is what, you know, we that's how our journey started. And that's what we built uh, early Feb this year. Right. So now let me just dive in into, you know, for how we start looking at any use case. Since then, we've been building, um, you know, for so many use cases, we've built out our ag models, we've, we've fine tuned, we've, uh, you know, gone through several use cases of different kind of customer requirements but yeah this is where we start from we always run quick pocs using prompts and what we start with is we don't worry about context length because context length of the uh, model is something we can worry about later so initially what we're trying to see is how well is the llm following the instructions how much of hallucinations is there uh, is there any steerability issues? When I say steerability, this is more from a conversational context perspective where you want the LLM to follow instructions in a particular manner. So are there any issues here is what we are trying to check. Um, and we run the best model and to see what, what, what works, right? When I say the best model, it's not really the best in terms of you know, just going and getting it done with the GPT-4 or something like that. The best is very relative. It's dependent on the task we are trying to do. It's dependent on what kind of latencies we are looking for. You know, what is the model context length, everything. So that is the best model for us at this point of time. And all we are trying to do right now is basically just check if this is a scenario we can handle with an LLM and do we have enough signals. Right, so the next thing we do, which is uh, around prompt engineering. Now, when I say prompt engineering, uh, the whole idea and premise, um, I'll take a pause here, Shiva, if you can just let me know uh, the poll, what came out. Like, I just wanted to check, like, what kind of, uh, what have people yeah, we got, Yeah, we got 17 votes, out of which half the folks said they've heard of LLMs. Uh, about another half say that they played around with toy projects. So only about 10% of the folks have kind of said, uh, just two people essentially out of 20 have said that they've built a production feature. So okay. most people have not taken it to production yet. Got it, got it. So yeah, so when we talk about prompt engineering and uh, this word has been bandied about quite a bit uh, since LLMs came into the picture. And what we are talking about essentially 
is very simple. Uh, it's keeping instructions clear. I think that same thing holds true for humans as well. And the same thing holds true for LLMs as well, is how clear we make this communication. So this is a sample prompt that we use. Um, so we start with, let's assume, the first block is persona, right? How, what should the, how should the LLM actually behave? If you do not give the persona, and if you say, uh, if you just ask, uh, you know, who am I talking to? It's going to say, uh, I am an AI language model, and you know, et cetera, et cetera, which you do not want, especially in a conversational uh, scenario. You don't want the bot to say that. So you need to give the persona to the bot, right? And when I'm talking about this particular thing, it's very structured for our conversational use case. Uh, and this could differ from uh, diff for in different industries and whatever you're trying to build. So the first thing for us is to build a persona. And then you have the company context. Right? What, what is the context of the company that the bot is representing? Is there some general things we should talk about and let the bot know? Then comes the objective, saying what is the objective of this bot? Uh, what is it trying to do? And then you kind of nail down the conversational instructions where you give it step by step of what you need to ask. So you need to ask, let's assume in our case, we need to ask the name, the email, and the phone number. You give it in a stepwise manner. So the more cleaner and clearer you make it, the more likely you're going to have uh, you know, um, less uh, issues of steerability. And then is these response instructions, where you're basically telling how the response should be. Right? Should you uh, output it in a bulleted form? Should you output it you know, concise manner? Should you make it very detailed? All of them can come into. Uh, response instructions and guardrails is something that we attach to all the prompts that we build which is basically like a safety net uh, what is that the llm should not do right do not use prior knowledge or you should not uh, you know use whatever whatever is uh, not allowed right all of that come under guardrails so when we start building the best way what we have seen is we keep it very simple to start with and we iterate and keep building it up so we kind of add complexities in layers uh, we use some of those very known prompting techniques and i'm sure uh, people who kind of worked a little bit would know about chain of thought which is the cot uh, technique right i mean this is one thing which kind of uh, caught and but there are of course a lot many which have come uh, so it depends on you know what is the use case and if chain of thought is not sufficient then you go explore other things uh, so we do this chain of thought and we test everything every time so every time anything changes we test it so let's assume you believe that okay you want to change some conversational instructions you add point number four and you think the responses are not going to change well uh, that's not how it is right so every time the prompt changes the output is going to change so it's very important to be very systematic about this that as in when we build these layers we test everything every time so that's what we do uh, we have you know a lot of versioning that happens uh, in the props and um, we make it as reproducible as possible so the idea of reproducibility is that especially when um, you know it's a typical case we are implementing for some a customer, someone has tested, but then another person tests and says, oh, this is not giving that same answer, and it's kind of doing something else. So how do we increase this reproducibility? Again, this is something that is task dependent, which is where we say, OK, we want to make it like we can keep your temperature setting low. Temperature is, in the LLMs, is what defines uh, as to how deterministic or diverse the output should be. And this is something task dependent. So let's assume that you are doing a very creative kind of task where you need that diversity. Uh, then you wouldn't want to make it very deterministic. When you say deterministic, it also kind of can get repetitive. But in some cases, it works well. So uh, OpenAI also recently launched uh, more parameters for reproducing re reproducibility, like OpenAI has now the seed parameter which you can send in uh, um, you know whenever you're doing an api call and you'll make the you know output very uh, deterministic it, you'll get the same you'll get back the same result every time and they all also send back something called as a system fingerprint which you can track and that helps you to know that uh, if the model version is the same if the seed parameter is the same and the fingerprint is the same um, uh, you know um, you're going to get the same response uh, right. So in terms of uh, prompt testing, uh, 
you sh i'll just uh, be covering that in a bit so give me a moment and i'll be covering it now so uh, when we talk about um, versioning right so in our case we have uh, the text of the prompt but we also have a lot of functions we have for instance dynamic prompting uh, now, when we say dynamic prompting, we build the prompts on the fly. So we've got features in our product where we say, OK, we want to do conditional prompting. If the person is asking, if the person's intent is to book a car demo, uh, then let it be conditional. If the intent is car demo, then make sure you ask for when the person would want the demo to be done. Right. So all of that, when the you know the date of the demo, et cetera, et cetera. So all of that actually comes in as part of a dynamic prompting. So which is actually functions that we put, which is a part of the code. And we also have, uh, you know, when the, the moment you say prompt, the prompt is also telling the LLM how the response should be output. So there is also functions which do output parsing. So the whole of these set of things are basically a version for us. And that is what we uh, that is how we version these prompts separately. So all of them together are one version for us. Uh, and then many times we also have to maintain versions for each model and provider so that we know which one is applicable for which. Uh, right. In an ideal world, you could say that you would want the same prompt to work across models, but that's not really the case many times. As we have seen that the prompts that work great on uh, some of the OpenAI ones don't work that great on Llama. And we have to add uh, many more instructions or change it, right? So in terms of the prompt playground tooling, um, so there are a lot of uh, tooling that has come. And they're kind of intrinsically tied into the evaluations also. So when you say prompt A is better than prompt B, you need a way to version it. You need to you need a way to be able to evaluate it as well. And that is how these, some of these tooling uh, is built. So we have managed solutions like weights and biases where you have prompting and the evaluations built in. You also have open source uh, like prompt tools by Hegel AI that is self-hostable. And that's something that we're just experimenting with. Uh, but right now, what we do is we run our prompts through our tests, uh, where there are a separate test of, uh, you know, set of evaluations which we run, uh, which comprise a set of steerability checks, hallucination checks, QA retrieval checks, and all of that, right? So every time uh, we change some prompt, we are actually running it through all of these checks. Uh, and I will be covering more on evaluations in the upcoming slide. Right, and let's look at how we did it in our product. So when we say modular prompts, um, and one of the way to kind of tackle hallucination is building modular prompts. The idea is uh, keep the prompt simple. Uh, there is less likelihood of it going off track. So let's break it down into modules. And this is exactly what we did. Uh, so we have something called as recipe blocks, which actually defines how the chat conversation should actually happen. So each of these blocks is how the uh, flow will work. And you will see that there's something called as a smart AI block. These are our um, you know, prompt-based blocks. So you can just attach different blocks one after the other, and you can all chain it together. So each of these blocks could be a very modular thing, which is very small. And therefore, it becomes very easy to handle that. And then it can go on to you know, the next uh, prompt. So the routing itself happens based on what is the value that has been captured. So let's assume there is a block which is actually capturing uh, the customer name, contact number, email ID, et cetera. So once those things are captured, it will kind of route it to the next block. So there is a success criteria on, on the basis of which it moves. There are failure conditions for fallbacks. So that's how we've kind of built it out. And uh, this whole prompt chain can you know, help us control conversational uh, uh steerability and we also enable uh context retention so obviously when you're moving across different prompts which are modular you need a way to kind of retain the context across these different blocks and the way we do this is uh, we have uh, bot memory which are basically things that you populate and store it keep it in memory and you can reuse it you know what was the number that was shared or email ID or the intent of the customer. And all that is available for every block uh, for it to respond better. We also can pass memory in terms of the actual chat history itself. And we also pass in terms of summarized kind of thing, which we do and 
you know, keep the context across blocks. But this modular way of building gives us a lot of control and makes the system much more reliable. OK, uh, yeah. Right, so then we come to um, conquering hallucinations, right? And this is a word uh, that's been used quite a bit. And I'm going to kind of try and uh, break it down a bit. So this is from an archive paper where they have talked about uh, different kinds of hallucinations. So for instance, in this case, the user is asking for, can you recommend a delicious recipe for dinner? Right? But the response is not talking about dinner. The response is talking about lunch. So the first part of the hallucination is input conflicting hallucination, where the response is not what the user is asking. The second kind of hallucination is context conflicting hallucination, where uh, in this particular scenario, there is a context where the it's about a recipe. And in the end, the LLM says, enjoy this steak. Right? There was no mention of steak anywhere, but it has used that. Uh, so context need not be only this. Context can also be when you are injecting external context and where the LLM does not use that context or kind of deviates from that context. So that is also context conflicting hallucination. And then the third one they're talking about is fact conflicting hallucination, where uh, LLM has said that the tomatoes are rich in calcium, which is not true. So that is a fact conflicting, right? So how do we uh, look at uh, mitigation techniques? So the first one, which I just showed you already, is a modular prompt. Uh, and then you have a chain of thought and other techniques. So while we are talking about chain of thought, uh, let me show you what I mean. So this was uh, this is an example. So we do a lot of uh, post facto analysis on the conversations that have happened on our platform, uh, which is for different kind of chats. We have quality metrics. So let's assume there is a metric like this of how effectively did the agent resolve the customer query and rate from 0 to 2, 0 being the lowest and 2 being the highest. Now, if you were to give this query directly to the LLM, uh, it's going to give you some number. Uh, right, and you don't know on what basis it has generated the number, and it also might give you a reasoning if you have asked it to give the reasoning, but you do not know how reliable that is, and you do not know whether it has taken all the things that you wanted, you know, it to consider. So that is where this chain of thought comes in. So you break down uh, it, break down the whole problem or the question into smaller parts, uh, like you would exactly you know how you would do it for a child is how you would do it for an llm right how what is the customer concern did the agent acknowledge the customer concern what are your findings did the agent provide suitable resolution so you make it think step by step so this is uh, this is what we are talking when we're talking about chain of thought so the idea is to give it time to think give it time to find the reasonings and finally arrive at the answer Right. And then uh, you have in-context learning. In-context learning is basically when you're giving some examples in the context of the prompt itself. Right. So um, let's assume you have a particular case where uh, this uh, case itself, where you want the LLM to recognize some particular, uh, you know, in this case, let's assume uh, you want it to output something in a particular way. What was the customer concern? And you want it to particular, uh, you know, you want it to uh, use only certain concerns and you want to give some examples of how you have classified it. So you can give few short examples. And these examples go into the prompt itself. And that is in context learning. Uh, and then you have preventing hallucination snowballing. And the whole idea is that. Um, it's LLMs are auto regressive models, which means that uh, it will start with the first word and then it, based on whatever it has output, it will start generating the next token. So the subsequent tokens are all dependent on what it has generated before. So you can imagine uh, if I were to ask it to generate a score, it will give me some score. And if I ask it to generate the reasoning for that score, post uh, you know outputting of that score what it is going to do is it's going to justify that score which is not what we want so it is always better not to give you know not to prompt it to output the final result first 
instead you kind of ask it to think it through and put the findings and finally it will output the score so this is actually the um, prevention of hallucination snowballing and then you have citations where let's assume you have given some context and uh, you have gotten uh, some a uh, lot of documents and you have these documents which have some document ids and you have given it the context saying uh, this uh, line or these uh, paragraphs are from this context uh, document one document two is this and all that so when it is generating the response you can ask it to refer to that citations you can say that you know tag the citations from the context and add it in in your response so that gives a certain level of safety right so none of these is 100 percent foolproof but all of them add on, right? So it, it's just layers and you're trying, you know, the very best to put in all kinds of checks and balances to reduce uh, the possibility of hallucinations. It's also possible that despite all that, you know, you find that there is a limit to how much in context learning or how many few short examples you can do. Uh, when I say limit, it is basically, you are just in increasing the number of tokens you're sending and that's going to increase your either in terms of cost or in terms of uh, your compute. So it is better to kind of restrict the number of tokens you send to an LLM. And that is where we come uh, to some of the other methods like fine tuning and retrieval augmented generation, which is something which is very common now and which is the go to uh, thing first for any external uh, context. Right. And I will talk about um, RAG in much more detail in the next slide. We have then verification methods. How do we detect hallucinations? So there are a lot of papers which have come out um, where you you know people are talking about consistency based methods. And what these consistency based methods are is the core premise is that if you ask LLM to generate a response. Uh, let's say five times or six times or n number of times, if it has not hallucinated, it is likely to generate very similar responses every time. But if it has hallucinated, there is a high probability of it generating different responses every time. So the whole idea is, if you ask it n number of times, are the answers consistent? And this is the verification method. This is a very common method now for figuring out if there is a hallucination. Um, for us to be able to do this in real time uh, was a challenge because all of these are separate calls. You have to generate n number of responses and do these kind of validations, which is not viable for us, which was not viable for our real time use cases for many of the kind of scenarios we had. So what where we use it is more for offline evaluations when we are doing testing or uh, you know in between if we are doing monitoring and evaluations, it is in those cases we leverage this, but we don't use it in our uh, real time use case. Uh, there is also post hoc correction. So once you figure out where the hallucination is, uh, you can actually try and go and correct that particular sentence. Again, uh, so there are papers again around this where there is a Google search done. So especially for this fact conflicting hallucination that we saw here, uh, there are uh, tools that you can use to do an intermediate Google search. You go and check and whether you check whether it kind of matches and then do your corrections, right? But in our use case, we don't use it um, because real time scenarios, it's not feasible. And most of our cases are also very customer driven documents. So we don't really do Google search and uh, provide answers. Right, so this was something we saw and yeah, so uh, retrieval augmented generation. So I'll take a pause here just in case anyone has a any question till now. I know there's a testing question, which um, I'll take it a little later. But any other questions so far? OK, so, um, so in terms of RAG, the whole idea of RAG is uh, it enables us to bypass this context length limitations. And this is something we use extensively because um, when we are doing multi, uh, multi, uh, you know, in a SaaS uh, context, especially multiple tenants, we want to use client specific FAQs and documents. So we use this for external context injection into the prompt. So based on the FAQs they're uploading or internal documents, uh, we kind of 
use that and then use that specific context into the prompt uh, during inference time. We can also customize it for uh, client specific uh, response synthesis. So there could be certain clients who want very detailed uh, answers. We had seen in one of our clients where they want very bulleted answers and uh, how they wanted the responses to go out. And this could be different from uh, you know, one, one client to the other. So in this process, we also evaluated various vector stores. Um, vector stores are where we store these embeddings. Embeddings are basically numerical representations for uh, the contexts for each of the um, contexts that we have. So it is just a way to store this and to be able to. So the whole idea of RAG is you retrieve the most similar context and then use it while you are doing the LLM generation by providing it to the LLM and saying that, OK, now this is the context. Use this context to generate the final response. So when we started out uh, for our POCs, we started with something very basic and simple because we were just trying to iterate rapidly to see how well this works. Uh, we, we checked it out with FES. Uh, but soon, obviously, FES was just good for a quick POC and checking uh, the whole feature out. Uh, we then evaluated a couple of others like Chroma, Quadrant, and VB8. Uh, we picked VB8. Uh, basically, we because we are looking at some features where, uh, so VB8 gives us a GraphQL kind of interface where we can fire queries directly in GraphQL. Uh, it supported hybrid search out of the box. Uh, when I say hybrid search, we are saying a combination of embedding and also a search based, a string based thing, which is uh, BM25. It provides that out of the box. Uh, and we also wanted a metadata based filtering. So the client documents that are uploaded, we have various metadata that get linked to these documents, like you have tags, right? So you might say that these documents are India specific, these documents are uh, you know, some other country specific. So all of these, uh, so this is the metadata of the, doc the document itself. And these also are something we want to use before we actually do the filtering inside the vector store. So we wanted something which supports it, because not all vector stores support these kind of things. And um, uh, again, VB8 allows the entire thing for an enterprise implementation, replication, sharding, and all that. So we've currently uh, we host VB8 on a C2 standard 8 machine, where we got good RPS, almost about 300 plus RPS, and we know we can scale it out very quickly, right? Um, Right. So the next thing is in terms of fine tuning. Right. So there are cases where we have to fine tune the model uh, because of various reasons. Sometimes um, it's not about the uh, the knowledge, but it's more about how well the LLM is able to follow the instructions and the kind of responses the LLM is generating. So when we are fine tuning, we can fine tune with closed source LLMs or we can fine tune with open source LLMs. Uh, it always uh, normally gives higher quality results than plain prompting. Uh, there's also token savings because you are not kind of sending the entire in-context examples and everything. You can just do away with all of that, and you can just you know go with shorter prompts, and you know you can you'll get lower latency. The flip side is there is a longer feedback loop. We have to kind of curate the data, and this is. Um, you know, specifically important in this kind of fine tuning because data quality is far, far more important than the quantity of data we have. So it's very, very important to even if you have a small set that it should be highly uh, and a very good quality uh, curated data. Uh, so we use open source uh, models with uh, when we fine tune open source models, we've used LoRa and QLoRa adapters uh, and uh, yeah, and of course, in our use case, there are a lot of uh, things that we're trying to look for, which are common, especially across these multiple tenants. The idea is to see whether we can use some common adapters and kind of use it for all the clients. But there might be certain, uh, you know, client-specific cases also for which we have we can put in specific adapters. When I say adapters, these are the LoRa or QLoRa adapters, which is the, um, you know, which is the uh, tech, uh, which is the algorithms that everyone is using for fine tuning these models, right? So, so this is an important question that keeps coming up, uh, right? Should we do RAG 
or should we do fine tuning? And uh, I have borrowed this particular image from the recent OpenAI talk. Uh, I thought this was a great way of visualizing of whether you should go with uh, injecting external knowledge or uh, using RAG, or should you kind of fine tune? And the whole idea is, are you injecting external knowledge, or are you bringing about a behavior change? If you are injecting external knowledge, you go with RAG. If you are doing a behavior change, you go with fine tuning. right? So to give you an example, if I want, uh, if there is a customer scenario where uh, we are talking about, say, Mm, what is the process for opening a new account in your bank? And uh, there is a process uh, stuff that is laid out. This is an external document or information that I can feed in into the LLM. This information is also likely to change. Now, tomorrow, your process might change. Or uh, even, uh, even more, uh, you know, um, big, better use cases, let's take interest rates, right? You want to check out interest rates that are there. And these can keep on changing. You don't want the model to learn things like that, right? So you would not want to fine tune or model for such kind of knowledge. What you're trying to fine tune for is behavior. When I say behavior, uh, to give you an example, let's say your model is not outputting in the way you want it in terms of a format. Let's say you want a JSON format. And the model does not always output a JSON format. Or you see that uh, you know there is more. Um, the, the, it's brittle, right? So those are cases that are good use cases for fine tuning. The second thing comes is how frequently is this knowledge going to change? If it is something that is frequent, which uh, uh, you know, then it is better that you figure out is it a rag or is it a fine tuning thing that you're looking for? That means it could be an external knowledge only you're talking about. So there is also cost implications for a multi-tenant scenario when you are hosting it for multiple clients. Uh, so which is why most of the time when it is client FAQs, we are talking about RAG. Uh, but yeah, there are always cases where we have to kind of fine tune models for our clients as well. Right. So we also hear a lot about LLM agents. So agents are. Uh, you know, where you can do tasks. Um, till agents came, LLMs were more around just um, giving you text responses. But agents allowed us to do tasks, which is reason uh, what the what the task, what the question is about, figure out which uh, tool to be called. It calls the API. Then it gets back an observation. It reasons based on the observation. And then it responds, right? And this could kind of repeat. This process could repeat. So we experimented in with uh, the agents back in August. And what we did see at that point of time, and more recently also when we evaluated, is uh, you know it had this tendency of sometimes going rogue. Uh, when I say rogue, it means like it will call in an iterative fashion. It starts calling multiple LLMs uh, continuously. It increases latency for us, especially in our scenario when we cannot afford to have these kind of multiple calls. Um, you know, it started increasing our latency. Sometimes it used to hallucinate answers without calling the tool, right? So, you know, don't get me wrong. Many, many times these things are great to use when your use case is kind of very defined and simple. In our case, what happens is we also have to consider the conversational aspect of it. So. When uh, you know some of the times before this tool calling has to happen, there are certain inputs to be gathered, and which happens over the course of a conversation. And after the inputs have been gathered is when the API call or an action has to be taken. So which means that the agent has to be robust enough to wait to gather all the inputs and then perform the call. right? So in such cases, we saw that you know it failed for us in many cases especially for the kind of use cases we tested on. So that is when we decided to detach this action component from the reasoning component, basically for better observability and control. The idea is the first part of the component just reasons it out, figures out what has to be done, and gets all the inputs that are needed. And it tells us that a tool has to be called. But we do the tool calling. 
and we have a control on which tool is being called and how many times it's been called and has the tool already been called so do we have the context already with us and stuff like that so it gave it gave us you know better control on the whole thing um in terms of um again a question that comes often is should we use closed source or open source um for our use cases and um, what we do within uh, our loop is we kind of support both uh, the idea is that sometimes clients want uh, open source for data privacy requirements etc so we kind of support both of course closed source uh, with their apis is are very easy to use you can build very quick prototypes to get started and they also have especially if you see gpt4 it's still the sota model for many tasks however there is also vendor risk we recently saw the whole thing that happened in open ai um so that's that's the risks we carry uh, open source obviously gives us much better reliability and control uh, but uh, many times you might have to kind of look at fine tuning uh, for many use cases uh, especially to make it conform to what you need which is what we did uh, but it helps us greatly for handling clients who have specific data privacy requirements who don't want the data to leave our systems um, the other thing obviously is the whole deployment infra setup that this one needs uh, right in terms of gpu and the hosting of these models and of, obviously last but not the least is the whole cost evaluation so when we evaluated these costs um, so there is a lot of um, ambiguity in the sense that it depends on a lot of factors actually so are you going to be intermittently using this or are you going to be continuously using um, the llms uh, so is it if it is going to be intermittent you might have to actually validate whether api you know closed source apis are cheaper in terms of having a machine which is hosting a model which is continuously you're paying um, you know like a fixed price on that so we we kind of look at all of these and also depends on what kind of hosting framework is there how many tokens per second you are able to generate and then compare the costs roughly if you kind of have the machine continuously giving and continuously running and you know at um, uh, you take a typical llama 2 7 billion model and it is uh, hosted on a uh, 100 gpu we are talking about still a self hosted costing coming to about 10 to 15% of open ai costs and here i am taking GPT 3.5 Turbo 1106 uh, version, which is the latest version they've released. Yeah, but as I said, it depends on everything, all the other factors kind of tying in, and then basically take a call on the costing. Right. So in terms of uh, deployment options, what we use is basically um, we use A100 and A10 GPUs. uh depends on the kind of model we are hosting of course we currently have uh, llama 27 billion that we've hosted uh, the ones bigger um had problem with the kind of latencies we were looking for we also checked out some of the newer models that have come out which which are basically okay for cpu inferences uh, we have uh, which are the ggml and gguf formats right which has come out and these are yeah uh, yeah shiva yeah we have to change the prompts uh, what we found is what worked great on gpt 3.5 turbo uh, we have to kind of change quite a bit for llama right but since we have fine tuned it it kind of uh, gives us a boost but yeah we have to change the prompts because we see that each model has its own uh, unique things that you want to counter so sometimes when you are giving prompts what happens is when i said it iterative it also happens that sometimes you see the outputs uh, right and you realize that okay this is something that it should not ask and you have to go and fix that in the prompt right and we saw this in some of our use cases when um, uh, yeah so uh, so yeah in some of the use cases where we saw uh, that um, we wanted the llm to actually ask uh, you know do an intent classification and not ask for the account number but interestingly every time we had the llm so let's assume i have a question saying 
uh, I want to open an account, right? Uh, instead of doing the intent detection, it would ask for, can you tell me the account number, right? So I don't want the LLM to ask for account number. And this behavior, to change this behavior, we had to kind of fix the prompt as well, right? So some of these things that come up are very model specific. So we do end up uh, maintaining different prompts and for different models. And we have, when we do versioning, we also do it for uh, specific models and the providers we are using. If it is open source, we have its own versions and its own prompts for the tasks we are doing. Yeah, and yeah, rack pipeline. Yes, I will cover rack pipelines. And hmm. So, rack pipelines we did. Uh, yeah, query formulation we do actually um, because we realized that when we are sending it with history, specifically in a conversational context, um, we had issues with uh, the rag understanding with history. And we do query uh, rewriting before we send it to RAG. We don't use uh, anything which kind of increases our latency further. So currently, we we kind of experimented with re-ranking a while back. But no, we don't use re-ranking as of now. Uh, Fine-tuning the embeddings, not really right now. But what we do experiment with is a lot of uh, figuring out what kind of embeddings we want to generate. Uh, whether we want to kind of use the base chunks or we want to introduce global metadata into it, or how do we want to chunk it, right? What kind of uh, overlaps do we want to give? Uh, do we want to kind of do a global filtering before we go to the individual chunk? You know, those kind of things is what we've done so far. We've not fine tuned the embeddings per se. Uh, how much percentage of closed versus open source LLMs used internally? So. Yeah, this is actually more from a customer requirement perspective. Uh, as I said, there are certain customers um, who are very specific, especially on our banking uh, side, where they don't want the data to go out. So those are all under open source. Um, so cost difference, as I said, yeah. Um, the same thing what I said uh, is about 10 to 15%. So you take, for instance, uh, Google right now is, if you take a one year, I think it's about 1,800 something per month if you go with a one year uh, costing. And the same thing, uh, so this one is just about 10 to 15% of what you would otherwise spend on the closed source. So our loads also vary. So while we have benchmarked this, but in actual scenarios, um, the so we, it's not like it's completely loaded. We use some of our open source models more for the QA kind of things, where we do a lot of batching kind of work. And some of um, the most of the batching stuff happens on open source, but there are clients where the requirements are such that they are OK with using closed source, and we pass it on to closed source. Right. So most of the uh, load testing that we do, uh, we do it through uh, Locust. and uh, when we were trying out all of these models, so we were basically evaluating the hosting uh, frameworks based on our load testing. So we looked at um, text generation inference, TGI from hugging phase, and VLLM, which is very common. And when we were load testing, uh, we did see actually some amount of failures happening for VLLM. So we've kept VLLM on the standby, but we intend to kind of relook at some of those numbers again. But currently, we have our models hosted with TGI. Uh, for fine-tuned models, we look, we kind of merge these adapters and host it. Again, um, we have a call whether to self-host it or there are a lot of deployment platforms also to fast track. Uh, we have things like Replicate and Modal and RunPod, et cetera who fast track the whole deployments, uh, including True Foundry, right? So all of them fast track the whole deployment cycle. If you have your own infrastructure, they allow you to kind of deploy it via Helm charts, and they make it very easy. Um, but yeah, that's a call you can take. In our case, we've host, hosted it with TGI. Uh, as I said, we are kind, kind of continuously evaluating. Uh, it stands as of now, and tomorrow this whole scenario might change because things are changing so rapidly.
so how do we uh, look at inference efficiency so the whole idea is um, smaller models of course are going to give better efficiency leaner architectures um, where you are doing a decoder only models right they're going to be faster and quantizations are something um, like where we're using 7 billion variants, right? So if you use a smaller one, and there was a paper which came out recently where someone was doing uh, medical uh, information, uh, was trained on a 3 billion one, and it was uh, performing quite well, right? So, so we can kind of look at making the um, model smaller and use quantizations, and then thereby making the uh, inference uh, increasing the inference efficiency then you have vector store quanti you know the optimizations that you can do so for instance the vector store that we use uses an algorithm called uh, hnsw which is hierarchical navigable small world mm -hmm. and this uh, algorithm can be tweaked to make it kind of run faster at runtime to say okay i'll search only lesser nodes and then that makes the inference efficiency go up you can do horizontal scaling, which we ha which we have enabled. And then we also have the amount of cache you want to keep, like how much is the memory versus the disk, right? So VV8 has its cache, which can store these um, embeddings in memory. And that makes the whole thing faster. Prompt token optimizations is basically not just about input tokens. And one key thing is many times the latency is dictated by how many tokens you are ending up generating and not so much on how many tokens you're sending. So the number of tokens it has to generate, because it generates it in an autoregressive manner, uh, the number of tokens you ask it to generate is going to increase your latency. So if you can make the generations more concise, then the latencies will be lower. right? And these are the kind of things we are experimenting on for many of our voice bot kind of scenarios. Because in speech, we also have a constraint on you know how much latency we can allow. Uh, caching, there is uh, we can do semantic caching, um, but that is something that we are still experimenting on. So the core idea is that you hit this cache first and check if it is semantically the same thing. You don't go and fire an LLM query. So this would obviously have huge gains. It depends on how much uh, you end up getting your cache hits. So yeah, that is something we're still experimenting with. Of course, we have all of the other things like built-in. We are doing async and queuing and all of that, uh, which kind of uh, make sure that all that part is optimized. Uh, infrastructure, we currently use GPUs. But yeah, uh, we never know if the CPU inference latencies, we start getting better, we might kind of switch out to CPUs mainly from a costing perspective. Then there are inference server optimizations, depending on the kind of inference server you are using. If you're using, for instance, a text generation inference, the kind of optimizations that it brings in. So it has things like continuous batching, page retention, flash retention, and all of that, right? which brings in. Uh, so depending on the um, server that you have chosen, you get optimizations there. Uh, then you have, finally, you have streaming. And one thing I missed writing is the batching part as well. So especially when you have um, streaming is a great thing. But in our case, uh, again, something we are experimenting with for our voice-based scenarios. But the moment you have output formats, like you say, JSON formats and all, uh, streaming is not you know, extremely feasible. right? So these are, again, in, in terms of voice, we are experimenting with streaming. We are also checking out batching for a lot of our uh, QA-based uh, metrics, right? Where we can batch the requests and send. Right, so comparison parameters between uh, LLM orchestrators like Langchain and Llama Index, and which one did you choose? So to be very honest, we started with all of them. So right now, we use Langchain for uh, our uh, LLM, uh, you know, LLM calls and all the other tasks. We also use Llama Index for uh, the specifically the uh, QA bit, RAG bit. We use Llama Index. So what we found is in um, Llama Index, right? We hit some bottlenecks in terms of the kind of uh, in terms of inference latencies. And when we were doing our load testing, we found that you know it was adding to a lot of bloat for us. Um, 
with the kind of abstractions that Llama Index and Langchain have. Uh, even Llama Index had a lot of uh, abstractions built in. And for every call, uh, we found that it was much faster for us to hit the vector store directly. So for while we use the Llama Index and everything during our training pipeline, for our inference pipeline, we've come out of Llama Index. We directly hit uh, the gra using GraphQL, we directly hit our vector store. Right. So we've kind of completely come out of uh, some of these of, during our inference, mainly because of the bloat it was adding uh, for our um, requests. Right. And another thing, of course, not specific to one library, uh, it's a pain point is every time a uh, version changes, um, uh, we find that a lot of things are broken. Right. Uh, so there's a bug in one version. We move up and suddenly uh, there are a lot of dependencies which have changed and a lot of code uh, which breaks. Right. So that that is an ongoing process. And I believe that these libraries are evolving so fast. It's bound to happen. But that's the risk we run uh, by being over reliant on them as well. Right. So. Um, in terms of reliability, um, the whole idea is how well do we design for fallbacks? Uh, when I say fallbacks, it is like what happens if the LLM doesn't respond in time. Uh, so obviously, all of these libraries like Langchain have got their retry logic and all implemented. But for real-time use cases, we could, again, not think of using it because every time you're retrying, you're spending some, you know, you're making the user wait which was not something that was possible for us. So we had to catch these failures and move out fast. So we create fallbacks by using uh, another model as fallback, which could be a very simple, um, uh, you know, like a, a model, which is like a sentence bird kind of a model, which is just an in-house model. So, but there is some fallback. And uh, sometimes it's a simple embedding based search, or sometimes it's a transfer to agent. So the idea is that we capture failures and design for fallbacks. Then we build guardrails. The whole idea of guardrails is to ensure that the LLMs doesn't completely go off track. So we do defensive prompting. Uh, the idea of defensive prompting is you think of possible attacks that can happen, like, for instance, your um, prompt leakage or unsafe content or whatever it is, right? And you build uh, these into your prompts you attach this to your prompts uh, before it hits the you know final uh, the uh, response hits the end user and then you have other kinds of guardrails as well but again the the other guardrails are stuff that happens once you've gotten the response you can ask the llm to recheck certain responses you can ask saying if the output format or whatever else you are expecting in your output is not there you can build in uh, guardrails to kind of recheck the responses but again this involves latency uh, we have not used it for our conversational use cases but there are some places which is more offline which is more batch based qas where we have built certain guardrails as well uh, the llm evaluations per se uh, again we have to do offline and both online evals after each change or upgrades um, and I'll be talking about LLM evaluations right after this. So in terms of um, we also have to preempt prompt breakages, right? So when we build for specific customers, now these uh, customers have their own prompts that they want the bot to kind of follow for their conversational context. And we ensure that these prompts don't break because these prompts have been tested with certain model versions uh, and the entire thing, which uh, you know, um, kind of is tied together. So when these models change, these prompts could break, uh, right? Uh, so it's possible it doesn't break, which is always the best case scenario. But it's also possible it breaks. So we make sure that we kind of save the models that are being used to create these prompts along with the prompt versions, so that these breakages don't happen. Uh, again, ensuring consistent uh, responses through reproducibility. And then finally, implementing more of uh, LLM observability and monitoring. Right. And yeah, this was a question that we had earlier. Um, right. So um, 
I hope I have kind of covered most of the other questions. Right, quality of responses, right? Um, so in terms of uh, evaluations, the first thing is, right, you have the LLM generation capability itself, which is the uh, the thing about the model itself, like is Llama 2 good in terms of language generation or is Mistral better, mm -hmm. right? Which is the language generation capability itself. And there are many leaderboards uh, and benchmarks which kind of talk about how fluent is the LLM, is the um, generation coherent, etc. But more important than that, what we found is it's better to evaluate on our specific domain tasks. And many times what you see on the leaderboards might not always corroborate with what you find on your own tasks. So when we evaluated on the domain tasks is when we came to know, OK, there are certain models which are great for instruction following. Uh, or some models are not so great. There are certain models which are not so good with multilingual stuff, right? Uh, so all of that gets more uh, pronounced when we are testing on our tasks. We could look at benchmarks which kind of loosely correlate with the task we are trying to do. But yeah, it's very important to kind of not rely completely on the um, published benchmarks. Uh, so when we do evaluations, we look at basic evaluations. One is, uh, just to give you an example, there are format checks, like how we want. We want a JSON format. Is the format uh, adhering to it? Uh, we have guardrail violations in terms of, is there a safe content? Uh, you know, Has the safe content guardrail been violated? Has there been prompt leakage and stuff like that, which we check as part of you know, continuous tests, which run uh, It's part of a CI CD pipeline itself. Then you have task specific evaluations, right? When we say task specific evaluations, you have, uh, say, performance on that specific task. So let's say we're trying to do summarization, right? How well did the LLM summarize? And that is you could have a ground truth. In some cases, you have a ground truth if you're running it as part of a fixed data set. And you could just kind of check whether the summarization matches, um, you know, with conventional metrics, you could use the rouge and meteor based kind of metrics, right? Simple ones. And or you could use LLMs as well, where you don't have crowd truths. Then you have hallucinations. Now, hallucinations is like a big thing in terms of how we look at hallucinations. Uh, now, in some cases, if you have ground truths, you could look at how closely it kind of uh, goes with the ground, ground truth. You could do n-gram-based metrics and all that. Then hallucinations are also something you could evaluate with your LLM-based prompting-based methods. Uh, and hallucinations, as, as I was telling, can also be evaluated with consistency-based methods. So we leverage all these three depending on the kind of task. So there are certain tasks when we are trying to evaluate with fixed data sets where we have uh, like standard sets we've created for rephrasing. So every time as part of CI CD pipeline, it runs and we kind of check we haven't broken anything, right? So these are standard tests. So for this, we have the ground truths. We can check with the simple engrams or uh, you know the other non-LLM based approaches as well. But then wherever there are no ground truths is where we are kind of relying on these consistency-based metrics. You have self-check GPT, which is a paper which came out where they have a lot of uh, metrics around that, like how you could check these consistencies or agreement between these answers. right? And uh, you could also use uh, more powerful LLMs to evaluate hallucinations. So for instance, uh, let's assume you want to kind of evaluate hallucinations on GPT 3.5 Turbo or a Llama. You could use a, a GPT 4 actually to evaluate if there are hallucinations, right? And you could break down the whole premise is that any response you get, you break down into atomic facts and then validate each fact separately to see if there has been a hallucination. So all of these, um, you know, we bring in into the picture. Having said that. Uh, do you not have to do human validation at all? I think uh, still there is some amount of human validation you would need to do, especially for critical customer use cases. So we would not completely do that. But it is more of sampling kind of approach rather than doing an exhaustive checking. right? So we do that more to validate whether the human validation is in agreement with some of these uh, approaches we have built in. And where is the deviation? And that is something that we keep correcting. So in conversational tasks, 
there is a steerability, right? Uh, if, as I was telling you about the prompts and how it kind of passes on from one prompt to the other or one block to the other, we are basically seeing whether those variables that we wanted to capture, have they been captured? And are you able to steer it well? Does it go to the next block? Did it ask these questions that you had? And this we are doing uh, you know, in an automated manner. We've built in an automated system where it can simulate conversations. It's like a two-way conversation which happens. And we have short conversational snippets which get generated. And based on that, we can evaluate steerability. Some of this is code-based. Like you could check whether these variables that you wanted to capture, did were they captured, right? So you could kind of just run that. And some of them, is which is more subjective, you could do an LLM prompt-based evaluation, right? And then you have, uh, you know, uh, QA-based checks, uh, question answering based checks. And um, for that, you know, there's, uh, there's this excellent uh, open source library, Dragas, uh, which we are kind of looking at and leveraging that is um, they have uh, built, uh, you know, a lot of metrics around retrieval uh, and the generation. So in retrieval, they're looking at context precision. Uh, which is how well uh, or whether the relevant items that you retrieved, how many number of relevant items did you retrieve out of the total context that were there. So it is basically looking at context precision. And it also looks as context recall is all the information there which is required to answer a particular question. Then there is un context relevancy, which is how relevant is the context given a particular question. Similarly, they have things like faithfulness, which is actually about the generation aspect of how faithful is the generation to the, um, you know, to the um, specific context that was provided. Now, given a context, was, was that answer that was generated faithful to that context or not? And that is a part of faithfulness. And then, you're, you know, you have answer relevancy, whether the answer is relevant to the um, the generated question or not, how relevant is it? If you have um, uh, the answers, ground truth answers, you could also do answer similarity. But many times what happens in these tasks is you don't always have ground truths. Right. Uh, yeah, I am talking about the Ragas Exploding Gradients library. I think it's a great library. Uh, we uh, we've kind of incorporated some of these things into our models during evaluation how do you make sure the models don't memorize the output corresponding to the input right so the whole idea is um sort of and am i missing some other question before this okay so the whole idea sort of is that um uh, we first of all when we fine tune which is why i kind of drew that fine line between when should you use fine tuning versus when should you use uh, uh, retrieval augmented generation if you think that there are facts uh, don't make the llm learn those facts right it is better to keep that away and um, uh, you know use that in just injection just use it for injecting in the context but if you're trying to change a behavior, like change the output formats or change the way the LLM. So just to give you an example, uh, we recently had a case where we had to kind of look at um, a grammar evaluation, right? And grammar evaluation was very subjective. Whatever context we give and however many um, you know examples we give, sometimes it's not enough to communicate at what point do we want a grammar check to fail. And that is one case where we had to use fine tuning, right? So this is not really about memorizing. This is more about understanding how to answer that particular question. And if I go back to that OpenAI slide, and I would recommend all of you guys to see that if you haven't already watched the OpenAI Dev Day talks, I mean, it's a great set of uh, talks you could listen to. And where they kind of differentiate this, they draw a subtle line between, let's say you're going to an exam and in one case, you are given saying, how should you answer a question? So you say, OK, if it's a maths question, then I'm going to say uh, lay out all the steps. And then I'm saying hypothesis. And then I say, hence prove, right? This is how you have to solve a question. And this is more about a behavior. And then 
we tell you, okay, you go to the question, uh, you go to the exam, and then you are given an open book. You can kind of flip the pages in the book and then write the answers. So the difference between fine tuning and RAG is this. In the first case, where you are telling how you should answer the question is a case for fine tuning. Wherever you are saying where you should kind of um, learn the facts and kind of answer the question, that is a RAG use case. Did I answer your question, Saurabh? Right. Um, right. So um, we finally look at LLM observability and monitoring. The whole idea is uh, to make sure that we know what's happening. Uh, so in our uh, systems, we log all the requests and responses and the prompts which were fired, which model which uh, provider was used. We track the token usage, which allows us to monitor client level usages. Extremely important, especially for a SaaS-based product to kind of monitor this. Uh, so all the token usages, we basically mm, log in into ClickHouse from where we have a set of dashboards and reports which get built out. Uh, for timeouts and latencies, we keep, you know, this is something that is not just for our ML services. So our entire ML stack is basically microservices that are deployed along with a whole lot of other platform microservices. So whatever happens for everything across the services, what we use for this as well, we use open telemetry, which uh, logs these traces into um, Prometheus and uh, agar tracing and all that and where we can see the bottlenecks that are happening and finally it kind of gets reflected into the grafana dashboard right which is for the latencies for the token usages also is something we have reports built out so we can track uh, you know in terms of time how the tokens have varied across clients how the tokens uh, token usages have been uh, we also run our evaluations basically uh, which are more like jobs we run. Uh, currently, we don't have a dashboarding as such for this, but we more uh, do it in terms of jobs which we monitor, which run at regular intervals. The core idea is wherever you are doing LLM-based evaluations, we don't want to incur too much of costs here by running it continuously all the time. There are certain evaluations uh, we can kind of do, but these LLM-based evaluations we don't do you know, continuously. We monitor it at regular intervals. Uh, and we can also manually trigger for a given client, which uh, picks certain samples and uh, run the evals. Right. So, yeah, uh, I think, yeah, with all the things uh, that we've done, and I would say that we are still on our journey, we've not reached the end, and these are just intermediate milestones. Um, we see, uh, we see, we saw a lot of improvement in the deflection rates, right? With uh, these are basically deflection rates are how many requests are not passed to the agent, but instead resolved by the bot itself. Uh, we saw an increase in our CSAT ratings by the customers, and uh, also how much the average handling time has reduced for the agent with all the. So we have a feature which is the agent copilot, which is very similar to what you saw on the bot it's just that it's not on the bot level it's at the agent level so the responses get generated and shown to the agent and all the agent is doing is instead of typing out the responses the agent is just validating the response and sending it so that kind of saves a lot of time uh, specific client successes where clients have reported their average response time uh, have reduced by 55 percent right so a lot of uh, good things and i feel the journey is still on and we have a lot to learn and share and learn from the community overall. So, yeah, thank you. And if we have any questions. Now, folks, if you have any questions, please, uh, you can also unmute and, and ask. Yeah, I would love to hear uh, what you guys have uh, you know been doing and things that you faced uh, it would be great for you guys also to share all right 
Uh, yeah, there will be a there will be a recording version. I'll share the recording. Uh, I'll upload the recording over the weekend and and send it next week. Okay, cool. If there are no other questions, thank you so much, Asha, for taking the time. And uh, yeah, this is a very useful talk. So hopefully, a lot more folks will will take their items to production. Thanks to you. Thanks so much, Shiva. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. And bye. have a have a great holiday time. Bye. Yeah. Thanks. Amazing session, Asha. Thank you. Thank you.